We talked a little bit about some of the components of what uh, a, a strategic planning system is all about. And one of the things that we believe that is very important is for us to take a look at the respective environments that we operate in. So today we're going to learn about personality, the differences of personalities, and uh, about relationships. Good morning and welcome to the OCIO learning session for January. I'm Stan Boo and I'm sitting in for Dr. Melanie Cohen this morning. Melanie will be returning to this seat in February. Uh, and uh, very excited about the uh, topic this morning. And uh, before I get into the uh, introduction of Dr. Durney, we want to make sure this is an interactive discussion this morning, so at any point during the presentation, feel free to pop up and ask a question or offer a comment at the microphone in the middle. Also, there is a sheet at each table if you want to get training credit for this, just sign, sign it and we'll collect it afterwards. We'll make sure we get to the credit for this. So at this point, let me introduce uh, Dr. Chris Durney. Uh, his bio is on the tables. It's also been circulated via email, so you uh, have some of the details, but I want to just lift up a couple things. Uh, obviously, a lot of academic uh, experience and credentials in the area of management, science, and technology and innovation from jo George Washington University. But what's really intriguing, in the bio, Chris lifts up that he was a COBOL programmer. And for some of us, that is a badge of honor. And so uh, uh, he's uh, supported federal executives done international development programs. Chris has actually been engaged here at HUD for some time. We've personally worked together. He's supported me on some of my initiatives. So I've had a chance to uh, uh, see the talk walked, if you will, by working with Chris. And so uh, with that said, uh, let me introduce Chris Durney and welcome him to uh, the learning session today. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. So Chris, uh, I guess the quest first question I have for you is, uh, what led you to settle on this topic, this topic of uh, practical skills and giving good instructions? Um, that's a good question, Stan. <laughs> uh, I think the, uh, the basic, I, I've, I've uh, learned a lot of academic kind of management stuff over the years. Um, I've been in a lot of sessions like this where people have talked about theoretical stuff. I wanted to put something um, on Dr. Cohen's schedule that actually has affected the way that I work. It's actually affected the decisions that I make and, and, it, and when I think about it, that is, you know, when I, when I actually get out of my day to day and can think from a, um, um, from a reflective point of view, it actually changes some of the ways I approach my colleagues, my superiors, and, and so on. And I'm hoping that um, by going over this, and I called it a very practical skill, by going over this that maybe we can convey to uh, the folks uh, here and, um, and the folks online um, a little bit of the sense of how this thinking about instruction can help you communicate and work more effectively. Okay. Okay. If we look, in fact, at the objectives, I'm going to hope that, um, we, that, that there are two basic things that we want to accomplish. I want to alert you to the importance of good instructions. Instructions are all around us all the time. Every day we take them and we give them. Okay. It's part and parcel of our work but we very rarely think about them independently of the work. And so I want you, to, I want you to, to leave here alerted to the fact that when you think about instructions, you actually can, there's actually some, some content, some format, some program that you can use to apply that will help you think about things. And then I want to, I want to discuss some styles, some instruction giving and some instruction taking styles. And, and help you figure out which is your preferred style and what that might mean in terms of your conflicts or your, 
getting along with various bosses that you have because it's really important as we go forward um, to think about is this conflict really because the person doesn't like me or is there something that I can do to change the way I'm, I'm communicating to help? So those are the, those are the, the, the things. And uh, we do have a good, um, a, a, a few good stories to share, I think. Um, I want to start just by putting you, though, in the context of instructions, OK? The fact is, instructions are all around us, all the time. And we already know a great deal about instructions, which I'm going to prove to you. So we're, we're, we're always, even though we don't think about it, we are always giving and taking instructions with others. For instance, when I say, you know, darling, I don't like Brussels sprouts, OK? Now, that's a declarative sentence, right? Simple statement of fact. My daughter posted this uh, picture of us on, the, uh, on her Facebook page the other day. We got 31 likes. <laughs> um, but she said, you know, I hate, I hate Brussels sprouts, but what am I also saying? I'm also saying, please don't serve me Brussels sprouts, right? That's my instruction to her. Because if I tell her this particular thing, I expect her to translate it into an instruction and some behavior response. Now, the second thing that we know about instructions is that some of us are really good at taking instructions. And others of us are better at giving instructions, right? We know that because sometimes I get this response. It's OK. They're good for you. You'll eat them anyway. And I realize that's her instruction to me and being the wise husband. I know that I'm going to be eating Brussels sprouts <laughs> for dinner. Um, so we know that we're sometimes a giver and sometimes a taker. By the way, my daughter posted this picture on her Facebook page, and it got 71 likes. <laughs> um, shows you the, the status in the family in terms of instruction giving, instruction taking. But, but the point is, is that there's both sides to the coin. Each time we give an instruction, we, have, we expect a taker. And we expect that taker sometime to negotiate with us, right, about what that instruction is. So, like, so, so you talked about the, uh, you know, kind of the situation between your wife and yourself as far as give and take. You know, in, in a normal environment where instructions are being received, instructions being given, is, it, is, it a, is there a winning proposition? Is there a winner in that? Or um, uh, depends on if the Brussels sprouts make you ill or not, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but, but it depends also on what kind of style you have, Stan. I think, um, for instance, if you're, if you're somebody that is an instructor, excuse me, instruction giving style where, where you are really um, limiting the response, right? You're just, you just want to tell the person what to do and have them do it. You're sort of the militaristic instruction giver. You don't want negotiation back. There's no room for that in that relationship, and that can lead to some real serious problems. But if, on the other hand, you're a little bit more open in terms of your, in terms of your engagement, your negotiation, maybe you settle for broccoli instead of, instead of Brussels sprouts to get the same sort of benefit. OK. OK? We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But third thing I want to say, just to give you all the context, is that there's, there's something, there are expectations that we have. We, we use instructions all the time in our lives. Right? And we have already pretty set expectations for what those instructions have in them. There are things missing in this. What do you think, Stan? Or what do you, what do you recognize right away as missing from this instruction? Anybody out there? How long to cook? How long to cook? How long to cook? The quantity of ingredients is missing, right? 
You'd like to know, I think, how big a pan you should put it in, right? There, there, any, any of the quantitative information is missing from this instruction, and we recognize it right away because we've used that kind of instruction almost our whole lives, so we've come to take it for granted that that, inf that, that instruction will have the same information in it, okay? And this is not the only one. This, is, this, this expectation applies to the workplace as well. When I go into the boss's office, because the boss has called me and said, I need you to do something for me, I go in and expect to get what I need to be able to execute. And what, I, what my expectations are based to some extent on who I am and what my instruction taking style is. So it's really important for us to think about these things because if I, if I come out disappointed from my boss's office because I, now I don't know what I'm supposed to do, um, I'm going to be in trouble when I go to execute that. And how many times have we left scratching our heads going, I don't know what they, you know, my word, how am I going to get that done? I don't have, an, I don't have any idea what they, what they want me to do. It's interesting, when I first saw the topic for this learning session, it's really kind of the first time I started to personally reflect on instructions. And we do take so much of this for granted because at least you know, when I think about it, our life is filled with instructions, whether it be like filing income tax or asking for directions to a place and, and so forth. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, I guess I, the thing I find fascinating is that a lot of, I think, the dysfunction, if you will, around instructions is not recognizing this giver-taker type of relationship and how important that is. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't you like to have just a little bit of the money that the IRS spends on developing the instructions for, for filling out the income tax? That, that, would, be, uh, that would be something. And the, and the last thing that we'll say before we, before we move on to the styles, actually, is that some instructions are um, clearer than others. <laughs> others might not be quite, it might, might leave some ambiguity involved, right? We see that the, uh, that the instructions on the shampoo bottle say rinse, lather, and repeat. Unfortunately, this person couldn't get out of that cycle. It's a little like a Stephen Wright joke, right? I have a circular drive, I can't get to work every day. Uh, but here we have we have the the idea that ambiguity is 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 present around us, and you know maybe seven out of out of eight people are going to look at that shampoo bottle and do the right thing, and then there's going to be that one person that gets that gets locked into the ambiguity. Shampoo bottles is a simple instruction, obviously. Uh, but putting together a toy, like a bicycle, for Christmas has become a standard joke, right? It's become part of the, part of the sort of mythos of, of bad instructions. And, um, and so again, it, it, I just want to point out that, that there's an art to, the instruct, to, to creating the instruction, there's an art to delivering the instruction, and a lot of it has to do with us. Are, are there also some personal biases, I guess, that we can bring to how we interpret instructions? I, going back to the example of a toy or assembling a bicycle or something like that, I can guarantee you my wife would tell you that when I go through a set of instructions, I'm probably skipping half of them, you know, bringing my own personal biases, and then I get to a point where I'm totally lost and so then she has to come through and methodically follows step by step yeah. and we end up getting to that final whatever yeah. whatever it is. I, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely true, especially in the mechanical realm. Um, I hate to admit that males maybe sometimes think they know more than what the instructions are telling them and can take that shortcut. And it's always that first screw, isn't it, that goes in upside down yeah. that you discover at the end, yeah. and you say, "Oh no, I have to take this whole thing apart." So, <laughs> so yeah, I think there, I think there are some biases like that, but um, I also think there are some special skills that each of us have of individuals that so somebody can look at those bicycle instructions and get the thing right the first time because they have a mechanical kind of um, creativity, and and um, and others will look at it and be stumped. Uh, so maybe there's a need for thinking about 
delivering instructions in multiple ways to make sure that you cover multiple people. Um, and I guess one other thing to think about, back to the recipe, um, my wife's uncle was a gourmet cook, and he regarded recipes as suggestions more than anything else, because he knew what, the, what those people, he wouldn't have needed the quantitative elements to the, to the, um, to the banana bread. He would have been able to figure out how the, how the, the ingredients go together. Um, so the level of, of expertise you have in the subject area sometimes affects the way you give and take instructions. So we'll, we'll have to think about that as we go forward. Richard Saul Werman is, is a guy who's written a lot about information, information anxiety. He's, he's the uh, fellow who, event, who, uh, who initiated the TED Talks, if you've ever been online and looked up the TED Talks. He's, a, he's a, sometimes a controversial figure about information uh, delivery and information architecture, but he's always provocative. And he wrote a book called Information Anxiety. And he wrote Information Anxiety in the 80s, and then he updated it, I think, in 2000, Information Anxiety 2. It was the book that I was reading, actually, when I had this, uh, this confrontation that I'll tell you about. Uh, I think it's uh, no longer in print, but uh, I, I meant to look last night. But, but you can certainly get copies of it for a buck off Amazon or, or some used book um, dealer. But, but there are many good ideas in here, and among them are his reflections on giving good instructions. He says, the essence of management is to, is to direct the future of the company or the organization by giving good instructions to your employees. Isn't that interesting? I mean, just think about that. It caused me to sit back and think and say, wait a minute, nobody's ever reduced management to a phrase like that. Giving good instructions. That you're going to direct the future of your company by giving good instructions to your employees. That assumes that you know at least a little bit about the future direction of your company, right? But it also means you know a lot about giving good instructions. And that's his key to go into his analysis of, of what they are, which we're going we're gonna to explore two different aspects of it today. So that's, that's sort of the key phrase, that's the key thought for this presentation. If in fact, we're directing the future of the organization by giving good instructions to those who we work with, and, and, and keep in mind, we're gonna be talking about managers to the instruction giver and the instruction taker, but you can reverse this from the instruction taker point of view, you can, all the lessons we're gonna talk about work in both directions. And you're also instructing your colleagues in a lot of ways. So what we're saying is not just a management kind of thing, it's an it's a organizational behavior kind of kind of uh, thing. And that's another reason why, why I like this topic so much. Um, we want to know how we can use them to work more, how we can use his teachings about instructions and our own reflections to work together more effectively. Okay? And that's really what we're going to try to accomplish. Any thoughts or, or uh, comments at this point? Melanie sent out a little a little paper beforehand. I'm going to ask Stan what his answers were, but but it asks you to reflect on what percentage of your work is taking instructions and what percentage of your work is giving instructions. You might think about that and just jot it down as as uh, as I asked Stan what his answers were to giving and taking. So, I, uh, so the, the role that I'm in is uh, rather unstructured and somewhat autonomous. You know, I uh, work with the uh, Open Government Initiative here at HUD. And so I spend about 60% of my time, I think, giving instruction and probably about 20% taking instruction. Um, okay, what, what's the other, like, 20% do you think? Doing the work stuff, I guess. <laughs> thinking about uh, thinking about the products and the objectives and those type of things. Okay, I mean, it, well, it's important to note that sixty percent giving instructions is also work, right? Right. I mean, it's, and and one of the things that I really want to emphasize as we go through, we'll point to it later on, 
is that is that giving instructions is not not doing work. It's hard to give good instructions. So so if you're if you are charged with giving somebody an instruction, that's a piece of work that you need to commit yourself to. It's not something you just toss off. And that's what that's one of the things that struck, that struck me. I needed to take more time, and I probably still need to take more time. There's a, the, to to like explain to people and to go through the rules of good instructions to make sure they know why I'm asking them to do what they're doing. Okay. It's interesting when I went through this uh, this worksheet and started to think about my personal experiences, and then referred back to one of your points about you know really synthesizing the definition of management down to giving good instruction. You know, I realized that I don't necessarily always get feedback, if you will, on instruction giving from people that are actually taking instructions. Sometimes kind of left to figure out on your own whether you're effective or not. You know, I guess ultimately, you know, whether you are successful achieving the outcomes that you're trying to achieve is probably one of the determinants then in how effective you are yeah. in giving instructions. Yeah, and if you get it done within the time frame that you need, you know, um, if you've defined the time frame, I think I think that's I think that's right. But I also think that there could be a level of frustration building up as people try to figure out what it is you need, and you're trying to dodge. You know, you're trying to to like tell them what you need, but it's ambiguous. It's hard, and that brings us to the story of my friend Bjorn. And this was actually the this was the uh, this was the story that that. The situation that really created my my appreciation for instructions. So I was working with a junior colleague on a project, and and the project was sort of undefined, almost like when you had to do the open government plan right. the first time, where there was no it, it didn't exist before. You're creating something out of smoke and mist, you know, and so it's it's innovative and it's and it's exploratory and it's research. You can't really. Always, always pin it down. That's what this kind of project was. And we had been through a couple of iterations when one day my door opened and Bjorn walked in with the latest corrected paper that we were doing. And I had, of course, when I looked at it, written in red ink all over it. And Bjorn came storming in, red, 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 red in the face, slammed the paper down on my desk and said, why don't you just tell me what you wanted in the first place? Why do you make me go through all this, getting it wrong every time? <coughs> and um, then he went storming out and slammed the door. And I thought, well, <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd never, Bjorn most of the times was a pretty calm guy. And, um, and luckily I was reading Worman at the same time. Because otherwise, I would have gone out and said, "Hey, get back in!" <laughs> you know, we would have had a little bit of a confrontation, maybe. Uh, I was less mature as a manager then, um, and and I thought, well, maybe we're having a conflict of instruction giving, instruction taking styles. So I said, uh, after I thought about it a while, I said, "Bjorn, come back in," and just to make sure everybody knows the context, would. I was taking an approach, I decided, that I would call evolutionary solution creation, right? In other words, we're sort of, we know sort of where we're going, but we're going to work it out over time. And what does that mean? That means we're not going to get it right the first time. That means we're going to do iterations. That means there's going to be a lot of red ink bled on his papers because, oh, by the way, I'm not going to do the, the grunt work. Oh, not the grunt work. I'm not going to do the development work, right? I'm going to do the shaping of it. That's, that's my role. And, uh, and Bjorn is going to be the one that suffers the, the real putting together the foundation, building it up, and so on. That's what I thought he understood. I thought he understood there were going to be iterations. I thought he understood that's the kind of approach we were taking. I would never explained it to him, of course. Well, it turns out, as I explored it with him, that Bjorn has a very different instruction taking style called, I just want to get it right. 
Or, you know, to put it another way, Stan, I just want to get an A. Bjorn was like a type A achiever, right? He just wanted to grade. I want to get an A. I want, to, I want you to tell me I did, I did the right thing. But every time I come in here, what you tell me is I didn't get it right again. And he was very frustrated. So like I say, luckily we were reading Worman at the time, and, uh, and it gave me, and it gave me some, some ammunition to, to, to approach it. So, so ultimately, what's the outcome? I mean, here you're in this space yep. where your comfort zone is around the evolutionary Absolutely. giving, and here you have Bjorn who needs specifics. I mean, how do you bridge that? Yeah, well, that was the, that was the trick. The first thing, and, and, and it's always good, I think, is to talk about what you're trying to achieve, right? So just sitting down with Bjorn and telling him that this has never been done before, Bjorn, I don't know the answer. I'm not holding out on you. I'm not teasing you. It's not like, it's not like this is a test that you're going through. We're actually working towards something that we haven't defined before. That in itself helped him a little bit. But, but I also said, in terms of giving him some goal to strive for, I found a document that looked sort of like something we wanted in terms of quality and in terms of, in terms of output, right? It just gave us a little bit of a model to shoot for. And I said, so this is not exactly it, because it, it hasn't been done before, but this is sort of the look and feel that we want as we go forward. And, and that confrontation or that or that exchange of ideas right there in terms of in terms of adding more detail giving him the purpose understanding the work the type of work we were doing really helped the relationship um, develop and we worked together for a couple more years on some very difficult projects and, and and got along just just fine but every time I had to remember he was a give me an A I want to get it right kind of instruction taker so you're able to kind of almost const construct an environment that he can be very comfortable in but still meet your needs. Absolutely. So. If you, it, 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 we need to be, the, the whole point of this, as, as I said before, is to alert you to the importance of good instruction giving, right? And if you're aware of it, you can amend your, your approach. If you're aware of your own style, you can amend your approach. But if you're not aware of it, you're, you're, you're subject to it, right? You're going to get, you're going to get, um, you're going to get dominated. So here are some instruction giving styles. Now I just look around as I, as I explain some of these to you. We don't have to explain them all, but these are pretty common styles. Some of them come from Worman, some of them come just from our own experience. But how many of you, for instance, have worked for a crisis, crisis, 911, call 911 kind of manager in terms of giving instructions? Any show of hands out there? <laughs> you know? You know? The, the, the crisis manager is the kind that calls you in and says, oh my God, throw everything else away. This has to happen right away. You know, we got to get it done. We got to get it done. Um, it's, it's always interesting when you're an instruction taker who wants things prioritized and put in order. It's always nice to be with a, with a manager who's a crisis manager like that, right? Because everything becomes, red, becomes the, the red. You got to do it now. Um, there were some others of interest. How about the, uh, the Henry, I'm, I mean, I know Henry Higgins, I'm assuming, the character from My Fair Lady. What's, uh, what's the correlation there to a style? Well, this is, this, is the, uh, this is the instruction giver who wants the instruction taker to be a small model of themselves, right? They want to create the instruction taker in their own image and likeness. So you have to do it exactly as they would do it. If you don't do it exactly as they would do it, then they correct you. No, no, it's the rain in Spain, you know. And, um, and so, and, and eventually, that doesn't lead to love, as we found out in My Fair Lady. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who remember, but this is, this is the person who wants to shape that instruction giver. Um, my dad was, was a great instruction giver. Um, he, was, he was sort of a, um, let me do that for you kind of, kind of instruction giver. I would go to him and say, Dad, I want to build a birdhouse. 
my dad, my dad's dead, so he can't defend himself. But he was actually a great man. But but I would say I want to build a birdhouse, and so he would say, okay, well here's how you use the measuring line. He would measure out the thing, and he would say, here's how you build the design. He would design it, and he said, here's how you saw the wood, and he would saw it. And by the time we got done, uh, you know, there was the birdhouse, and it was built. It was I was instructed by example, <laughs> but not by doing. So I I I, uh, I learned that I. If I wanted to learn how to build something, I had to build it on my own. I couldn't ask him for instructions. Um, any of the others strike you there? We don't have to talk about them all. Yes. Uh, now, would you get up to the... I'm Liz Clark with uh, Policy Development and Research. The Henry, Henrietta Higgins might be a bit like the federal government, and uh, things have to be done in a certain way sometimes, and we do not have a choice as to how it's done. And so I think sometimes we are creating our own little world again, and our own little employee, so that they do understand that when you write a memo to the secretary, it must be done this way, and you have to use these terms, and you may not use these terms, and that kind of thing, and sometimes in process travel, uh, overtime, whatever it is, we are trying to do that. And so I'd like to hear a bit more of your reflection on that in terms of the federal government. And uh, the uh, evolutionary solution creation, I would also like to hear in terms of teaching. Because quite often, I think, as managers, we go through and we mark up a draft. And one of the first things I do when I take it back to the staff person, especially if they are uh, relatively new uh, to the product or the process, is to compliment them and to say, this was really good. They see my red ink all over the thing. <laughs> but this was really good. This got me thinking and made me realize that you and I had not been through some things before. And you need to uh, understand that. We cannot use acronyms. Uh, people are not going to understand the meeting you were just in, and we have to be more explicit in uh, how we explain that. And a variety of other things that I think a lot of uh, younger, less experienced staff often don't get that opportunity to hear. All they see are the red ink, and they're like, I don't know why she's changing this thing, but I guess I'll go ahead and change it. And so uh, reflections on those two pieces. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I think the the um, the first piece it, the first piece I'll, I'll I'll defer until later because we are going to talk about um, the type of work and how that affects your your instructions and and if you and and if you're exploratory in the kinds of work that we talked about versus if there's a routine in place and so on and so forth. I wouldn't necessarily say that's governmental though because I've worked for places that are very, very precise about certain routines that you must follow. Um, if, you, if you work for a consulting firm like I do, you have to, you know your, your timesheet and the procedures around your timesheet, you know, because the, the firm is, 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 is subject to a review on that. So there are some very strict things, even outside of government, where, where those come. Let me, I'll, I'll treat that in more detail later. Um, but, but your suggestions about going back indicate something about your instruction giving style, which is, uh, which is one of, of engagement with the, the instruction taker and the willingness to walk that extra mile. Compliments, by the way, are always great. I don't do it enough, as there are people who will attest to that, my wife included, but, um, but, but compliments are, can never, are never lost. On, on the people you're working with. And that's a great way to start a discussion um, because they are looking at the red ink. And that's, you know, just like Bjorn was in, in that case. So, so I would suggest that what you've, what you've given us is a really good strategy for, for approaching somebody um, when their instruction taking is a little bit um, maybe um, shaky at the, at the beginning. 
So we've touched on some of the giving styles. What about some of the taking styles? Yeah, remember that we all have preferred styles both in giving and taking instructions. And by the way, they're not necessarily the same. Right? I may want to get, in terms of taking, I may want you to tell me all the details so that when I come out I know exactly what I want to do. But when I give an instruction, I may, I may give you just some general you know, parameters to go by. Uh, in order to in order to get the work done, I may not take the time to to do all the details. So it's not necessarily it, you know your taking style is not always a reflection of your giving style. But here are some of them. You know, Bjorn's style was I just want to get it right. I'm all thumbs. What is I'm all thumbs? You know, don't give me don't make me put that bike together. I'm all thumbs. Or that relationship you had with your father on building the birdhouse, there was almost a recognition that you were all thumbs as the, <laughs> or, no, or maybe, like, I'm, maybe I'm reading more that into it. That was my father's uh, interpretation. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, he was thinking, well, he doesn't know how to do it. He, he, he's going to hurt himself, so, so I'll, I'll teach him how by showing him. Right, how. okay. Um, the one I love from that list, though, is toting sequel font. Sure. We all know what that means, right? This is one of Worman's. I softened it up by calling it the fawning flatterer, but we're really talking about the bootlooker kind of person, you know, or the, or the person that walks into the boss and just gushes all over the place and, and, and wants to make sure that, that the boss knows that they're doing the right thing. Oh, yes, I'll do it. You know, that, that's a perfect job. Oh, yeah, great, thanks. And then they walk out. They may or may not get it done, right? They may or may not do it, but you're going to get sick to your stomach watching them interact with the boss. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I won't ask for a show of hands on how many of you have experienced colleagues like that, but it's not the most infrequent attitude uh, to management that, that we can have. Um, the, the other one I, I like, my, my, my sort of style, um, is... Um, I could ask some people to like identify which one it is, but I'll let it wait a while. Um, these things usually pass. Um, I believe there's a real benefit in procrastination, and um, you know, so I've, I've sort of sort of got that in part of my instruction taking style. I'm afraid, much to the frustration sometimes of my boss. My boss says. Now, when you think about these styles and the, and the, and the real um, genius of what Werman was talking about is that some of these styles go together and some of them conflict. And you can make up your own list. By the way, you can add any styles you want there. You know, there are, I'm sure there are styles you've, um, you've experienced that, uh, that you could add to the list and, and make them up your own, uh, yourself. Think of your boss now. How would you characterize uh, no, <laughs> how would you characterize your current boss? You know, it, it, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question. Um, but anyway, some of these conflict, so that if if you have the crisis manager who comes to me, I, I'm not gonna, you know, the crisis manager expects you to jump up right there and get it done. But I know these things pass. Um, sorry, Karen. Um, the um, you know it's not going to be it's not going to be easy for my manager to accept the fact that I'm not jumping up right away. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I'll pretend sometimes, and then I'll do whatever. Do what I'm you know. Really <laughs> what I was prioritizing. I shouldn't tell all these secrets. Um, you know, you have the over-the-shoulder supervisor. You ever work for anybody that's like right there all the time? And, and, and if you've got like, look, I'm a mature person. Don't boss me around. Just tell me what you need. That's a conflict of styles. That person's going to be there all the time, and you're going to say, don't you have work of your own to do? And after this session, they're going to say, yes, I'm doing my work. I'm giving good instructions by looking over your shoulder. Um, and we know that there was the conflict with, with Bjorn, right? So that, I explained that before. Y you can look and just try to compare some of those styles, see which ones are going are gonna to conflict. And then there are some that work together. 
Now remember, we're not saying, we're not, we're not assigning value to these necessarily, okay? Um, when you're all thumbs and you're admitting you don't know how to do something, that's not necessarily a bad, that's not a bad instruction taking style. It's, it's like, okay, help me along as long as you're not like just using it as an excuse. But, but let me do that for you is going to get along real well with somebody who says, I'm all thumbs, you know, um, I can't get this done. And um, just get there. I don't know. I don't care how you get there. It's going to work really well with somebody who says, don't boss me around if I, if I demonstrate what my output is. So as we think about our own style in any particular instance of giving instructions and taking instructions, then understanding what what the other's style is, is, is equally important. And, and adjusting our style to something that might fit and might make things go more smoothly is really the key to, to uh, getting along well, okay? So what should we do in terms of style? Well, you have to be aware of your preferred style. And, and as with, with most management advice, being aware of your surroundings, being aware of, your, of the way people react to you, being away, aware of the way you react to other people. You know, it's all grounded in emotional intelligence. Um, and one of, the, one of the things maybe we'll talk about someday, if Melanie hasn't covered it already, is the whole concept of emotional intelligence in the workplace, because I think it's a really incredibly important concept. So there's been a lot of focus on, from the giving, perspective, if you will, the awareness of style and so forth. Is it possible for a taker to change their style? Is that, a, is that adaptive? Oh, absolutely. If you're, if you're aware of your own style and you're aware that you can, you can move your position a little bit, I can, for instance, respond if I, if I, if I detect the urgency soon enough in the crisis manner, the real urgency, I can move to respond in more immediately to that and just put my other things on hold. Okay. Um, you know, we're, but the awareness is the thing, Stan, because if you're not, if you're just sitting there getting mad, you know, or, or you're feeling put upon or, or not knowing what to do, then, then you can't move. So, so that's, again, Understanding where you are and being sensitive to the style that, that you have versus to the style of the other person, that's the key, that's one of the key messages. Without that awareness, you don't move, okay? You don't understand. However, <laughs> it doesn't answer the question all the time, all right? There's lots of other things that get in the way of our instruction giving. And I don't want to come across as a Pollyanna who says, just understanding your style and the instruction take your style is going to be enough to get you off the, off the, uh, uh, the snide here if you're having trouble, okay? There are other things in our organization, structural things that can go wrong with instruction giving that you have no control over. I'm not giving you an out here. I'm just saying that's the reality of it. So for instance, there are multiple levels to instruction giving, as we know. The boss's boss gives the boss an instruction. The boss gives the instruction to you, and you have to pass it on to somebody who's actually going to do most of the work. Well, we know in communication, what happens? We lose information at each node in a communication channel. We know that when the instruction gets to your, to your boss, from, from her boss, that that communication is not 100% of what the boss's boss wanted, because some information is lost. And then when, when she communicates that to you, more information is lost. And when you communicate, that's just the structure of human communication. Nothing we can do about that. And, it, and, and in some ways, the more routine the work, the closer we can get to what was supposed to be done, mm -hmm. as it's been done before, the more ambiguous or, or innovative the work, the harder it is and the more iterations it's going to take to get close to what the boss's boss actually wants. And that's, again, that's just the structure of the way things are. If you get frustrated easily, you're not going to be able to respond well to that. 
Um, I, you know, I hate to, to, I really hate to bring up the second point here, but there's some people that don't care. They're burned out. They're they're tired. I haven't I haven't really in my career of 30 years in consulting with the federal government have never come to work and found any employee who's come to work that day and says I'm not going to do a good job today because I'm just tired. You know I've never experienced that with an individual in the federal government. But my but my sense is just in terms of of all my work is that you get to a point in your career maybe or in your in your consideration where you just have given up the thought that you can get anything done or you can accomplish anything. And that affects your attitude. Um, I, think, um, I think we have to take into account that if you're giving instructions to people who are in that state, you've got a lot more work to do in terms of, in terms of your motivation. And when you look at the, uh, at the employee um, motivation survey mm -hmm. and, and so on, survey. yeah, yeah. Um, you recognize that not, not all organizations are at the same level in yeah. terms of excitement and motivation, yeah. so on and so forth. So that always presents this background sort of feel to your communications. Okay. Um, and, then the, and then the last point, and there are other points, but, but the last point is changing management priorities. And you know that, that some jobs take you six months, let's say, you're on a six month task. Well, the priorities on that task may change two or three times over that six month period. That's a long, that's a long time. Um, and that, of course, jolts us when the, when the priorities change because we've got our mindset and going in this direction. There are other reasons too. I mean, instruction giving is a difficult thing in itself. And when it's contextualized in the organization, we have to take that in mind. But, but again, these are sort of contextual. They're not excuses for us not understanding our own style and, and, our, and trying to accommodate the other person's style. Okay? Any thoughts before we go on to the instruction themselves? All right. All right. So in, in addition to knowing uh, who you are and what your style is and, who you're, and what the style is, being sensitive to the style of the person that you're giving the instruction to or taking the instruction from, there are also some, some rules for constructing good instructions that um, Mr. Worman would, would like us to look at. Just ask yourself this question. Before GPS, this is, of course. Were you good at giving directions to your house or to, to wherever you had the place to go? How many people, let's see a show of hands. How many people think they were good at giving directions? Okay, how many people had some problems giving directions? Now again, according to Stan, we're measuring this at, as output, right? By the <laughs> right. output. That's right. Did the people get to the house? <laughs> or, or did they call you up and say, I'm sort of in the area, but I can't find the street? Okay. Uh, it used to be, it used to be um, a test of how much information you could give. We used to, when I, when I did an information communication class, we actually had a test on how few words you could use to give exact directions because we were talking about words being the currency, right, that you were, that you were spending in order to give, give good instructions. And, and it's amazing how many people added, you know, 50% more information than they needed and that, all that information did was confuse people. Other people tried to strip it down to the point where you were making the turn at the light and they never told you which light in the sequence because in their minds, that was the light that you turned at. What else would you have to know? All right, so think to yourself, before GPS, how good was I at, at the instructions? Here's a pretty good instruction. Just look through it and see 
what you see there. All right, what do you think? Yes. Hi, my name is Matt, and I actually work with Chris, so we'll see what kind of answer he gives me. <laughs> but, uh, I That's think, not uh, right, Matt. <laughs> something, uh, something I was thinking is, I think the direction is actually very easy to understand, but I think my own, when thinking about my own style, when you get to, you'll go over two long bridges, our house is about five minutes from the second bridge. Both myself and, for example, my mom, um, she's a lot less stressed when you give her more information. And I think some people um, assume that too much information will overstimulate and will cause stress. But for some personalities, more information eases you and allows you, for example, to, to, to look for the two bridges, to not be stressed, when am I getting to the first bridge? How about the second? And so it's interesting that Everything was very easy to understand until I got to the two long bridges that I'm thinking if I'm driving, I would have loved to have more information about how long between the two bridges are we talking, 30 minutes between the bridges, 10 minutes, maybe I went to a different bridge, probably not, but maybe. That's, that was my first and okay. only consideration. Good. Yeah, I, I, I think some, maybe, um, maybe somebody might ask, what's a long bridge? <laughs> What would you uh, consider a long bridge? Is it Chesapeake Bay Bridge or, or not? Um, this actually is a pretty good instruction from the point of view for illustration purposes from what um, Worman would say the, the key is to, to good instruction giving. It gives the purpose, okay? Now, purpose is, is very, very important for us human beings who like to understand the context of things, all right? Understanding why we're doing something is often a motivation. And that's often hardest, by the way, in some of these uh, more ambiguous things. Why are you doing an open government plan, Stan? Oh, because the president told me to. <laughs> okay. I guess that's motivation enough. Um, it also gives the end result. It's going to be a party. This is the destination. Where do I want to get to? That's why we get, when I gave Bjorn a model we want to get to something like this. It helped him a little bit in terms of where he was going. And then there's the core, putting your address, uh, put your address in the GPS. This is a simpler core than it used to be. Um, it'll take you about 35 minutes. And then anticipation, and that's the part you're talking about, uh, Matt, is that he suggests that you give them some of the, some of the route marks along the way to help them as they go. And so you might say to, to Matt, um, you might say, okay, here's, here's um, what the kinds of things you might expect as you try to do this deliverable. And finally, the error. And sometimes error helps. If you get to the boat ramp, you gotta turn around because you went too far. A recipe, error doesn't help. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if your turkey comes out overdone, you cooked it too long. Um, so you wanna think about that. Um, let, me, let me talk about two more things quickly because we're coming toward the about two end, minutes. end of our time. One of the things that I want to get across to you is that there are different kinds of instructions and this is a spectrum, okay? This is a spectrum. On the left-hand side of the spectrum, we have, um, or on the right-hand side, we have task-based instructions where you know everything about the, the process and you can specify every step-by-step. Step. And some people enjoy that, that type of instruction. On the other side, you have an op, a, a goal-based instruction. Here's a, here's a little stream. I want you to build a bridge over that stream. I want you to let me know who the contractor is and the, I want to see the design. And that's all. Otherwise, go build that whatever way you want to do it. Okay? That's the spectrum. The other, that goes along with what I was talking about before. And to go back to your original question about routine, work is on a spectrum as well. The work that we have goes from highly um, 
ambiguous, new work, research and development kinds of things, exploratory, never been done before, to something routine something that's been done over and over, some of those procedures that you were talking about in terms of the use of acronyms, so on and so forth, very hard uh, to go outside of the bounds of because they've been defined over time. And so the more, and, and by the way, your work will move from the right-hand side of that where you're brand new and in innovative to the left-hand side of that where it becomes routine, the more times you repeat it. So Stan, the first time you did the open gov plan, it was new. The second time, it got a little easier. The fourth time, it's gonna be more or less routine, okay? Your type of instruction has to match the type of work. And that's the last point that we really wanna make. It's not only a matter of style, but it's a matter of understanding the type of work you're doing and the type of instruction that's best for that. If I try to do goal-oriented work for something that's very routine, I'm putting people through a lot, a lot of uh, effort to come up with an answer that I already know is prescribed. On the other hand, if I try to be task-based about something that's brand new, I'm never gonna get there because I'm gonna constrict the creativity of the people there. There's a summary sheet, and these I, I believe these will be posted. These they notes will be? will be posted? Yes. The summary sheet simply says, look, be aware that you're giving instructions at all time. Understand your style. Match your style to the taker's style. Match the work type to the instruction type. And then, then the others are nice to have. You know, be passionate about your work. You'll convey that to your instruction taker or your instruction giver. Encourage others to, to, to take risks and allow them to fail. That, in a sense, is, is the best way to give and take instructions and to help young people grow. And so you can take these points and, and tie it back into what we've said uh, going forward. Excellent. Well, I hope you found this informational and some nuggets you can take back into the workplace. We really appreciate you sharing this with us, Chris. My pleasure. Uh, I hope. You find some, some good things there. And uh, you'll soon be receiving an email with the logistics for the February OCIO learning session from Melanie, from Dr. Cohen. So uh, look for that. And in the meantime, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Great.